Good evening. It's a curious angle. And Hello. Welcome. I'm, I'm in so many clothes and dressing gowns because it's so cold. I was just over on Instagram and everyone was saying they're freezing as well. So if you're not, if you're, if you're in some sunny, warm country, lucky you, we are here in the freezing cold having just watched. What I found was really brilliant. Yeah, really it, was, moving. it was very powerful. Um, and obviously a lot of you people here that are joining this live will be, or indeed the upload, will be people that have been affected by addiction like Mark and myself. Mm -hmm. No, I mean, I, I, I just thought it was an incredibly powerful, low-key as well. I thought it was incredibly low-key, unsensational, Classy. sort of very gentle step mm. through some of the very simple kind of dilemmas, questions, thoughts, and, you know... Um, issues obviously that come up with with not just sobriety but it was what was really interesting about it for me I think it really was about relapse and the fear of relapse as much as it was obviously that is always going to be about alcoholism and addiction and why one's an addict and all that kind of stuff but I thought it was really interesting about relapse because it really made me think so many things about how I think about the possibility of relapse I, I think Nadia you just said maybe people don't realize but I mean I'm 18 years sober We've been together next month, 21 years. In the We've first... followed quite a close sort of yeah, similarity yeah, with what went it's quite on. quite remarkable. Uh, and, it was, and the thing is, it wasn't actually just about... Well, it wasn't, it wasn't mainly about relapse. It, I think it was quite equally about relapse and about the impact on the person that loves an addict, you know. And I just went right at the end when Emma said, you know... And addiction is part of who he is, and who he is is who I love. And I thought that was a very powerful line, yeah. because that's what I've always um, said and thought about you. And when people say to me, you know, how difficult it is, um, I always say it's not as difficult as it is for him. But actually, I shouldn't say that so much, because it's just difficult in a different way. Yeah, well, I, what I thought was, what I was surprised by was how much we had of Emma Willis. Mm. And how so authentically vulnerable, vulnerable Reluctant. thoughtful, regretful, hurt, caring, worried. You know, I thought she was, there was not every single emotion she felt you saw. And for me, I can't get enough of being reminded of the impact of addiction, my addiction on those I love. And I thought it was a really telling moment when they said, and I think it was a theme that ran throughout it, about how they hadn't talked about things, how they hadn't sort of faced the, the sort of finer details of, of why he drunk and how it had played out and how that made them feel. And I, I felt, I might be wrong, but I felt and I sensed that there's still an enormous amount unsaid for Emma Willis, as there is for you, as there is for any partner of any addict or, or, or alcoholic. And I do think it really made me think again about that. So there's a kind of, it's not like an adage or a kind of rule or anything like that, because of course there's no rules with addiction, sobriety. But I do think that the, the aspect of sobriety that has a direct impact on relapse is the extent to which the addict a little bit like, I'm going to use a crude analogy here, a little bit like a training puppy is has its nose put in its wee or whatever. It was only when I was unable to avoid or escape you telling me the consequences of my behaviour. You telling me how you felt. And being in a room with therapists, counsellors, other family members all there to prevent me from using the same old tricks of self-deceit or justification well, or blame. And what, and what Mark means by that is that where Mark had went to rehab, they, and this is where I really felt for Emma because I feel it's, God, you know, this this gorgeous presenter that I see walking around that's been a guest on this Women, mm. that's been an anchor, and she's so, like just looks so together and so confident. And of course, she's so exquisitely beautiful. 
And I just felt so sad for her today because I thought, my God, you dealt with all of that on your own, not talking to anyone. Mm. Whereas the rehab that Mark went to, on the day one, they said, really, really, the family, if anyone from the family close can come and hold the person, the addict, the active addict accountable, you know, it will be great for for the for me in my position and for your partner. And when I imagine now, I was sitting there thinking, what would it have been like if I hadn't gone every Thursday to those, mm. to to the rehab, and sat in those groups, mm. and listened to other people? Because at the point that somebody goes into rehab, there's been a lot of madness in the mm. run up to that. You're just mm. broken. You're just frayed. You're just mm. finished. Mm. And there's a lot of anger when you get there, and this was what we were able to share in the group, that it's like, oh my God, they're in here, they're being looked after, I've got the kids, life's a bloody mess, mm. but because you're all talking in a group about it, it really, really helps. Whereas I imagine if I hadn't have been given that chance, that might have all turned in, mm. and then I would have got to a point where I didn't want to say anything about it. Mm. So why am I saying this? I'm saying... I suppose I'm saying if there's anybody here who's got a partner that is dealing with addiction or not dealing with addiction, I think it's so, so powerful and important for you to get help as well. Now, if they haven't gone into rehab, many, many people get sober just by going to AA. And it's really, really brilliant if you can also go to Al-Anon which is for the families of addicts because the impact is massive which the program showed I thought was I thought so did a really good job of that but I also thought it, it was a very so simple so line I made a note of that uh, Emma Willis said she said the thing of when they were talking about the fact that they'd never spoken it's always a surprise that you, you think that people can go through this amount of trauma mm. that's clearly such a sort of psychological uh, you know emotional kind of you know emotionally led thing i mean he he hadn't talked to his brother for four years he hadn't talked to emma about it pretty much until the filming of this documentary wow. that's a lot of that's a lot of um holding Suppression. stuff in and mm. not sharing and i thought her line was so sort of vulnerable and revealing mm. when she said we didn't really talk about it when we got past each traumatic moment because be there was such it. a relief yeah. to get past things I could really relate to that. The other thing that I was... But, but also, the thing is, Mark, those Thursdays when the families would get mm. together, we would also sit in the group with our addicts. I don't know how else to say it. It sounds like a terrible thing, but that's the only way I can think of to say it. And, and they would be held accountable. So I was literally... And I hadn't... I'd been out of EastEnders a couple, only a couple of years, so people literally were looking at me like this. It was so difficult, it was so difficult, it was so embarrassing, it was all of those things. But it was so important because the way that they explained it was, if you get all the shame, and he talked a lot about the shame, mm -hmm. if you get all the shame and guilt out, mm. because I think with you and with many people that I've seen with addiction problems, you get yourself in such a pickle, such a mess. Mm, mm. There's so much shame, there's so much guilt, and he spoke about that quite often, did, that you lie more and you hide more and you do. And for you, it was so cathartic because we said all the worst things that had happened in public. Mm. And then, like you said, the other addicts in the room held you culpable. So when you were trying to say, mm. well, you know, or do, they were like, no, that's the trick that I've mm. played, or that's the. And that, I think, got like down into the wound a bit, didn't it? And mm. dug out the sort of, the pus from the middle of the wound so that we could like, but I was angry for so long. I was angry for so long after you came out. I stayed angry for ages. But you see, but that's what this documentary really kind of, like, I, I, I think there's an enormous amount to be, Emma Willis's presence in this documentary and what she was saying and not saying in many of the scenes that she was in and her face, she absolutely, in every single shot, broke my heart. And she looked like, uh, and I'm saying this from experience, this isn't a kind of commentary on what I think could be happening for them. Just because you stop taking drugs or stop drinking, that is not the end of the problem. 
far from it. What will end up sort of punching to the foreground is all sorts of other things. We've talked. We've, we've talked a lot about yeah. this. We've talked about jealousy. We've talked about control issues. We've talked about vulnerability. We've talked about you know a sort of meticulous kind of frantic, frantic cross addicting to work, to drink, to you know to other things, all that kind of stuff. And what I sense in their relationship is because they haven't talked about it that much is that it probably is bleeding over they, they you know into other areas and aspects of their lives that that you know um are harder to kind of pin down sometimes it's really so neat loving, sometimes they? yeah they yeah so love each other yeah yeah so absolutely yeah, and they so care and they so want to get it right want to get and, it yeah yeah but you know so often you know it, it it's not just the substance. We can think about the substance. We can become obsessed with the substance that we're that, that, that is the cause of the problem. But it's everything else. I mean, he, he indicated it towards the end, didn't he, when he said the black hole and the black hole that's in us just keeps getting bigger I was thinking, and bigger. I bet that resonates. Well, really. and it resonates. And I remember when I was in rehab, I've t- talked about this elsewhere. Apologies if I repeat, but an incredibly, you know, soulful uh, therapist said to me, he said... The way in which we live our lives, we're all damaged in some way. We've all experienced trauma relative to ourselves. It's easy for us, there'll be people, po-faced people sitting there going, well, that's not very traumatic and you're not, you know. It's not about that. It's how, it's how experiences present to you against the tapestry of what was normal or not normal in your life. So... And he said that everyone has trauma, everyone has damage, everyone is negotiating those aspects of themselves. And he described, he likened it to a hole, but with a burning fire, a furnace that was kind of firing up. And he, his line on it was, was that when you relapse, when you fall into the jaws of addiction, you've tried, you've gone into that fire, you've tried to control it or grapple with it, and, you, and you've, you've got, but you know, you've got eaten up by the flames. And his line on recovery was, never put out the fire. I thought this was really important. Never put out the fire, but forever be aware of your distance from the edge because the fire is what drives you. And I think that's the thing that Emma Willis was talking about at the very end, which is, that is what makes, you know, I've yet to meet too many addicts or alcoholics in any meeting that I've been in who aren't profoundly interesting or got a lot to say. You know, I mean, there's a lot, there's a lot going on. <laughs> there's a lot going on in an addict. And I think that can make them quite exciting to be around. It can make them fucking annoying to be around as well. Um, but I do, I do think, yeah, that, that image of the whole, but for me, it's a fire. It's about that fire is a self-sustaining fire as well as one that can, that can potentially take you down. Well, I was, it's funny, isn't it? Because what I was hearing was all the danger in that. Yeah, and I in was what? hearing the whole fire analogy oh, right, yeah, yeah. because I was thinking. Um, I mean, we've had big conversations recently, haven't we? Where I've, I mean, there were so many parallels in what was being said tonight. Yeah, it was just yeah, freaking yeah. me out. But um, you know, Mark, I hope you don't mind me saying, but like over quite a long period of time I've been saying to him you you are now hanging on with your fingernails not in that he's about to relapse but there's a lot of stuff you're not dealing with Mm. and anyone who is the partner of an addict will see that disease doing press-ups in the background that's what they say in recovery isn't it Mm -hmm. while the addict still thinks they're fine and you Mm. can see it I can see it way before so I've been saying to what I think you need to get another therapist. I think you need to get back to regular meetings. 18 years sober can mean nothing like that. Mm. It really can. And and I'm so glad we watched that program too because it reminds us. Mm. And I tell you what broke my fucking heart when Emma said, and it sent like a shiver through my spine because I thought I've had these feelings over the last year. She goes, I was just so shocked after eight years. Mm. She said, I just couldn't believe it. And I and I and my I went like this in my head and went, yeah, and you're right, Nadja, to say that to Mark for 18 years. Because you've been in meetings, haven't you? And people have come in with 30 years recovery. Mm-hmm. And you've said, haven't they, in a week they've lost everything that they've built. Mm-hmm. When they pick, because when they pick up that drink or that substance, and I really do believe there's something different going on in the brain, like they showed us. I just believe that. I don't think it's a case of just control yourself. and do, I think there is something else going on in people's brains that are addicts. But, my God, everybody is vulnerable to it. 
But you see, this is one of the things that I thought was really fascinating about what he was talking about. I got thinking about, is it better to keep thinking about the fear or the potential of relapse? Or are you taking your eye off the ball to not be thinking consciously of the potential of relapse? This, and this is a really important question because this comes up a lot in AA meetings, which is the degree to which, Tim, I'd be fascinated to so know what you think. You know, if I live every minute of my day in relationship to the literal sentence of I must do this in order to avoid relapse or I must make sure that I, I I must make sure that I manage this scenario so that it's safer so that I don't you know that, that I don't relapse or I don't if I if I was to and I could do that and I remember thinking like that to begin with when I first came out of rehab a lot if I think about it like that too much I start parking the possibility of relapse into my day and into my soul mm. a lot more than not blithely ignoring it but for me not looking it face you know right in the face all the time is part of how I need to deal with it what you've rightly said and what I've started doing and in fact I was going to suggest that we did a how to stay married about this how I have taken my eye off the ball when it comes to 12-step recovery I am stepping back into that uh, arena to plug back in to Can I just to ask you on that question though, because I think it's a really important one you yeah. said, because I think that that is a point, you know, if every day I'm saying I am unwell and that everything is out of control and I'm an addict and I have to watch that every single day, there's some people that really need to do that, don't mm -hmm. they? But I think with you, that would ex could possibly exacerbate the problem. I think this I would be what, thinking about relapse in a way that but, I, I don't. But I don't think you use the word relapse I think you use the word, how well am I looking after myself today? Mm, mm. Because the consequence of you not looking after yourself could possibly be a relapse. It could be depression. Are you it could to be anything? It could be anything, couldn't yeah, it? Uh, I mean, like, I'm aware that I have to look after myself in a certain way because I, st I just start to feel a bit low. I I'm lucky I don't suffer from depression. I don't mm. have addiction problems. But I'm aware that there's a certain amount I have to do every day mm. to feel kind of okay. And I think that's the best. But what I see you do, and I'm sure there's many people here, either addicts or partners of addicts, that would that would connect with this, is what I see is you turn and you go into something else with such intensity so that you don't have to be, so you're not mindful of what you need to have a good day without it being about relapse. Yeah. Yeah, no, mm. I hear what you're saying. Because I think that's what the what it does. The mm. disease behind your back's going to you like this. Don't look at me. Well, Don't look at me. But and also, so, you know, you distract with everything else. But also, okay. there, there's the possibility that you know we think of relapse as picking up a drink. It, relapse could be something completely different. It could be a it could be a complete slip. I think you've relapsed many times and, without and, taking anything. Yeah, yeah. Because yeah, I yeah. think emotionally you've relapsed. Yeah. Because the thing is, what you must never forget is what the what you're using mm. is only medicating what the pain of something. Mm. Mm. So you can relapse with the pain, and that's what I felt with Matt. I felt he just he kept relapsing into the pain, and I was mm. so happy that he had this. He's had this epiphany about therapy and having to actually look at his childhood and really dig into it. Mm to be able to see what might be feeding the I fear. thought the moment where he was talking <coughs> about his breathing and that breakdown moment oh, was incredibly, God. incredibly moving. moving. Um, someone else just said that Emma, apparently Emma's seven years older than him, so whether, whether there's that sort oh of similar... Oh my God, similar, like you and me. <laughs> so, I mean, and the parallels with... I mean, the, the timings, everything, the yeah. amount of recovery, the I mean, marriage. They do say, Weird. I mean, that I was in rehab with, I think every, sadly, every single person of the 30 or so I was in rehab with, so sad. relapsed. So sad. Every, yeah, every single, in fact. That you know of. That I know of, yeah, but I kept in touch with all of them for such, such a considerable amount of time. Pretty much all of them. Two died. Um, and I remember trying to kind of firefight. Do you remember that poor chap mm. who was trying to kill him yeah we just had it was just so traumatic it was, so tragic. it was just it was just so tragic and awful and and you know i just sort of i just sort of think oh my god you know could be you. yeah i mean what and you wouldn't we wouldn't be together what would what would and have, we wouldn't have, would have kids happened? and your kids would be crying and saying what's happened to daddy and what's that every time we watch anything where there's teenage 
girls talking about their dads mm. and what they've gone Those through. Girls on that meeting. You know, so if you are still fucking actively doing whatever you want to do, and I'm thinking of one particular person I was having a conversation about today, and their teenager is going through fucking hell because of it, because they've just decided to pick up a drink again and not do anything about it. It's so important. It can, they say you can only get sober for yourself. I've seen that as not true because Mark would not have got no, sober. No, 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 I mean, no. And I can't speak for Matt and Emma, but it looked to me like Matt got sober because because of Emma, didn't he? I think and I, I personally think it's one of the. And you what, could see that epiphany when that young girl was talking. She's got very young children and talking about what it felt like to have their her dad mm. an alcoholic I mean one of the oh, problems so I do have one powerful. of the problems I do have with some of the kind of if you like rules of sobriety is that there are certain rules that need to be adhered to or it's felt that they should mm. be adhered to it's suggested in 12 step meetings etc Tim I'm sure you'll, you'll agree with this they're recommendations but there is a sense and I've seen this happen where if you in any way shape or form push against the standardised mainstream way if you like of pursuing Staying sobriety yeah. you uh, something of an arched eyebrow is cocked and then there's a sort of well you're courting potential disaster i find that a really um traumatizing and 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 horrible thing actually because the one aspect of everything that I was told and the received wisdom and what, you know, da, 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 when they said, you've got to do it for yourself first, because otherwise, you know, the idea that unless you get use your oxygen mask, you know, you can't help anyone else with their oxygen mask. Total bullshit. In my instance, it's, t and I'm not saying this is the case for everyone, total bullshit. I had to do it at the time for my three daughters and my wife. I had to. First, I because me, why would I want to do it for me if I was willing to kill myself with drink and drugs? And I feel so you know, yeah. I mean, so that that's the bit it's a ludicrous lunacy to say so to it's someone, only one that, way. there's not only one no, way, no, 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 but anyone. at that point, at the yeah. point of total devastation, rock bottom, everyone in pieces, to be told you've got to do it for you, I, I it never stuck, it never stuck. Obviously, over time, for me, I'll tell you what, my barometer of whether I've I've I'm a danger to myself is, is that if something catastrophic were to happen, a death of a close person or, or something like that unexpectedly, what is my first thought when I sort of run the kind of narrative of that? Is it to have a drink? Mm. Like, for example... I suppose that's why they talk about it has to be for you because if you were to lose that person that yeah. you're doing it for, you're immediately going to go yeah. back to yeah, yeah, drinking. Yeah. That's, that's where that... Comes yeah, in. yeah, yeah, That's yeah, why. absolutely, absolutely. So the idea it's is a that if sobriety. you are absolutely on your own on the planet with none of the people around, but that's such a sort of arbitrary. Guy. So anyway, so it really made me think about all that relapse stuff. The thing I was going to say, and I lost my thread actually, was when I was in rehab, the amount of people that came through, the tr the difficulty of dealing with relapse. Relapse is horrendous. I didn't. I've not had touch wood there, but for the grace of God, go I. I've not relapsed subsequent to rehab. But I did relapse after getting sober. I tried to be sober for about six months, didn't I, before I went in. And when I relapsed, it was, it was catastrophic. It was, it was literally I mean, it the was, worst time of it my was life. It totally was totally catastrophic. I've never been so terrified. And watching Emma and Emma like saying, you know, how scared she was. And I thought, mm. my God, that is all so in my past. Mm. But I suppose we rowed about it a lot since yeah. you got sober. I've been able to scream and shout mm. at you. Mm. I've been mm. able to say how awful it was. We've spoken a lot here. So it's mm. been cathartic, really, for me. Mm. Um, but, I, but I knew exactly what she meant when yeah. she said it was just yeah. terrifying. Absolutely. Yeah. Guys, it looks. Well, I'm looking, looking, at, looking at some of your comments. It's clearly really resonated with you. I think it was, it was a really gentle, meditative watch. If there's any, Healthy. if there was any powerful message that comes out of it for me, is that if you know anyone who is going into rehab, who goes into rehab, who is it needing, uh, you know, therapy of some sort, I would, I cannot recommend too much, including your family in that mm. process. I have too time. many examples. I can think of countless examples where the person has directly relapsed because they haven't had to face the, 
the guilt, the shame, and the impact of their behaviour on those people that and they all genuinely that suffering love. Suffering that um, Emma was going through, that she just kept to herself, and and now he, it seemed to be, I don't can't know, that he's got all this guilt about that as well, and it's. Mm. Yeah. I wanted to give her a huge... I mean, I like you both know, and him them. too, obviously. Them. Both of them. It was just, Absolutely but, yeah. loved them. My wow. God, you would never know seeing her walk down the corridors and coming to make... I did lose women with her about mm. six, seven months ago. She was anchoring. Just would never have known any of it. So there you go. You never know what's going on in people's lives. So, guys, if this is your first time to the channel, um, hit the subscribe button and the notification bell. And um, we'll see you tomorrow for Coffee Morning. See you in the morning, guys. Lots of love.